Chapter 9, September, Chocolate and Three Kings Day Bread Preparation The first step is to toast the chocolate beans. It's good to use a metal pan rather than an earthenware griddle, since the pores of the griddle soak up the oil the beans give off. It's very important to pay attention to this sort of detail, since the goodness of the chocolate depends on three things, namely that the chocolate beans used are good and without defect, that you mix several different types of beans to make the chocolate, and finally the amount of toasting. It's advisable to toast the cocoa beans just until the moment they begin to give off oil. If they are removed from the heat before then, they will make a discolored and disagreeable looking chocolate, which will be indigestible besides. On the other hand, if they are left on the heat too long, most of the beans will be burned, which will make the chocolate bitter and acrid. Dita extracted just half a teaspoon of this oil to mix with sweet almond oil for an excellent lip ointment. Her lips always chapped every winter, no matter what precautions she took. When she was a child, this caused her considerable discomfort. Whenever she laughed, the fleshy part of her lips would crack open and bleed, producing a sharp pain. In time, she grew resigned to this. Now that she didn't have a lot of reasons to laugh, it no longer concerned her. She could wait patiently for spring for the cracks to disappear. The only reason she was making the pomade was that some guests were coming to the house tonight to share the king's day bread. It was for vanity that she wanted her lips to look soft and shiny for the party, not because she expected to laugh very much. The suspicion that she was pregnant hardly brought a laugh to her lips. This possibility had not occurred to her as she consummated her love with Pedro. She still hadn't told him. She planned to do so tonight, but she didn't know how. What would Pedro's reaction be and the solution to this huge problem? She had no idea. She would rather not torment herself, would rather turn her mind toward more trivial matters, like the preparation of a good lip balm. For that, there's nothing like cocoa butter. But before starting to prepare it, she had to have the chocolate ready. When the cocoa beans are done being toasted, as described above, they are cleaned using a hair sieve to separate the hull from the bean. Beneath the metate in which the chocolate is to be ground, place a flat pan containing a hot fire. Once the stone is warm, begin grinding the chocolate. Mix the chocolate with the sugar, pounding it with the mallet, and grinding the two together. Then divide the mixture into chunks. The chunks are shaped by hand into tablets, square or round, according to your preference, and set out to air. The dividing points can be marked with the tip of a knife, if you wish. While Tita was forming the squares, she mourned for the three kings' day of her childhood, when she didn't have such serious problems. Her biggest worry then was that the Magi never bought her what she asked for, but instead what Mama Elena thought best for her. It was some years before she learned the reason she had received a long-for gift on one occasion. Nacha had saved up her wages for a long time to buy her the little movie she had seen in the display window of a store. It was called the little movie because it was an apparatus for projecting images on the wall using a petroleum lamp as a light source, producing an effect like a movie, but its real name was Zoetrope. What joy she felt seeing it next to her stocking when she got up in the morning, how she and her sisters enjoyed the many afternoons spent watching the sequences of images drawn on strips of glass which pictured different situations that were so entertaining. Those happy days when Nacha was with her seemed so distant now. Nacha, the smells, her noodle soup, her chilaquiles, her champurrado, her molcajete sauce, her bread with cream, all were far away in a distant past. They could never be surpassed. Her seasoning, her atole drinks, her teas, her laugh, her herbal remedies, the way she braided her hair and tucked Tita in at night, took care of her when she was sick, and cooked what she craved and whipped the chocolate. If she could bring back a single moment from that time, a little happiness from those days, she could prepare the King's Day bread with the same enthusiasm she had felt then. 
If only she could eat the bread afterward with her sisters laughing and joking, just like old times when she and Rosaura had not had to compete for the love of a man. Before she knew that she would not be allowed to wed, that Gertrudis would run away from home and work in a brothel, and when she still believed that if she found the doll and the bread, all her wishes would miraculously come true, literally everything she had wished for. Life had taught her that it was not that easy. There are few prepared to fulfill their desires, whatever the cost, and the right to determine the course of one's own life would take more effort than she had imagined. That battle she had to fight alone, and it weighed on her. If she could only have her sister get through these by her side, but it seemed more likely that a corpse would bring back to life than that Gertrudis would come back home. No one had gone for news of her since Nicholas had taken her clothes to the brothel. Putting those memories to rest, along with the squares of chocolate she had just finished, Tita began the Three Kings Day bread at last. Ingredients. 30 grams fresh yeast, one and a quarter kilos flour, eight eggs, one tablespoon salt, two tablespoons orange blossom water, one and a half cups milk, 300 grams sugar, 300 grams butter, 250 grams candied fruit, one porcelain doll. Preparation. Break up the yeast into one quarter kilo of flour using your hands or a fork and adding half a cup of warm milk a little at a time. When the ingredients are well blended, knead briefly, form into a ball, and let rest until the dough grows to double its size. Just as Tita was putting the dough to rest, Rosara made her appearance in the kitchen. She came to ask Tita's help in carrying out the diet John had prescribed for her. For some weeks now, she had been having serious digestive problems. She suffered from flatulence and a bad breath. Rosaura felt so distressed by these upheavals that she had determined that she and Pedro should sleep in separate bedrooms. That reduced her suffering slightly. She could pass gas as she pleased. John had recommended that she abstain from such foods as root and leafy vegetables and that she perform some active physical labor. This last was made difficult by her excessive bulk. There was no explaining the way she had gotten so fat after her return to the ranch, since she was still eating the same as always. It took an enormous effort for her to set her voluminous, gelatinous body in motion. All these ills carried with them an infinity of problems, the worst being that every day Pedro moved farther and farther away from her. She couldn't blame him. Even she couldn't stand the foul smell. She couldn't take it any more. It was the first time Rosada had plucked up her courage and discussed these topics with Tita. She confessed she had not approached her before because of the jealousy she felt. She had thought that there was an amorous relationship between Tita and Pedro, concealed, hidden by outward appearances. Now that she saw how much John loved her and how soon she would be married to him, she had realized the absurdity of continuing to harbor this type of suspicion. She was sure there was still time to establish good relations between them. To tell the truth, until now, the Rosaura Tita relationship had been like water in boiling oil. With tears in her eyes, she begged Tita not to harbor bad feelings about her marriage to Pedro. She asked Tita's advice how to save it. As if Tita was the one to dispense that kind of advice. With difficulty, Rosada reported that it had been several months since Pedro had approached her with amorous intentions. He practically avoided her. That alone didn't worry her too much. Pedro had never been disposed to sexual excess. It wasn't just that. It was his attitude. In it, she detected his frank rejection of her. And she could put her finger on just when it started, since she remembered it perfectly. It was the night that the ghost of Mamá Elena first appeared. She was awake waiting for Pedro to return from his walk. When he returned, he paid almost no attention to her story of the ghost, as if he were hardly there. During the night, she had tried to embrace him, but he was either asleep or pretending to be, and he didn't respond to her advances. Later, she heard him weeping quietly. Then she had pretended not to hear. She felt sure that her fatness, her flatulence, and her foul breath were driving Pedro farther away every day, and she couldn't see a solution. So now she was asking Tita's help. 
She needed help as never before. She had no one else to turn to. Every day the situation grew more and more serious. She didn't know how she would react to what they would say if Pedro left her. She couldn't stand it. Her only consolation was that at least she had her daughter Esperanza, who was obliged to stay with her forever. Until that point, all was going well since what Rosada said had produced pangs in Tita's conscience. But when she heard for the second time what Esperanza's fate was to be, she had to make a supreme effort not to shout at her sister that it was the sickest idea she had heard in her life. She couldn't begin a discussion between them right now that would spoil the good impulse she felt to forgive Rosada for how she had harmed her. Instead of voicing her thoughts, Tita promised her sister that she would prepare a special diet to help her lose weight. She kindly supplied her with a family remedy against bad breath. Bad breath originates in the stomach, and several causes contribute to it. To eliminate it, start by gargling salt water mixed with a few drops of powdered camphor vinegar, sniffing the mixture up into the nostrils at the same time. In addition, chew mint leaves constantly. By itself, the regimen proposed here, when followed rigorously, can purify the foulest breath. Rosada was infinitely grateful for her sister's help and quickly went out to the garden to pick some mint leaves, asking for Tita's absolute discretion in this delicate matter. But Tita was distraught. What had she done? How could she make up for the harm she'd done to Rosada, to Pedro, to herself, to John? How could she face him when she saw him in a few days when he returned from his trip? John, the person to whom she owed nothing but thanks. John, who had brought her back to her senses. John, who had shown her the way to freedom. John, his peace, serenity, reason. Truly, he did not deserve this. What could she tell him? What could she do? For the moment, the best thing she could do was to continue preparing the king's day bread since the leavened dough she had left to rest while she talked with Rosada was now ready for the next step. Use a key little flour to form a well on the table. Place all the ingredients in the center of this well and begin kneading, starting in the center and gradually adding a little of the flour from the well until all the flour has been incorporated. When the leavened dough has risen to twice its size, combine it with this other dough, blending them perfectly until the dough comes off your hands easily. Use a scraper to remove any dough that is stuck to the table so that it can be blended in as well. Place the dough in a deep container that has been greased. Cover with a napkin and wait for it to rise until it has doubled in size yet again. Take into account the fact that it takes approximately two hours for the dough to double in size and that it has to rise three times before it is put in the oven. As Tita was putting the napkin over the container of where she had set the dough to rest, a strong gust of wind banged the kitchen door wide open, causing an icy blast to invade the room. The napkin flew into the air and an icy shiver ran down Tita's spine. She turned around and was stunned to find herself face to face with Mama Elena, who was giving her a fierce look. I told you many times not to go near Pedro. Why did you do it? I tried, Mommy, but... But nothing. What you have done has no name. You have forgotten all morality, respect, and good behavior. You are worthless, a good-for-nothing who doesn't respect even yourself. You have blackened the name of my entire family, from my ancestors down to this cursed baby you carry in your belly. No, my baby isn't cursed. Yes, it is. I curse it. It and you forever. No, please. Chincha's entrance into the kitchen caused Mama Elena to spin on her heels and go out the same door by which she had entered. Close the door, child. Can't you feel how cold it is? Lately, you've seemed so up in the air. What's bothering you? Nothing, except she had missed a period and thought she was pregnant, and she had to tell John when he came back to marry her to cancel the wedding, and she had to leave the ranch if she wanted to have her baby without problems, and she had to give up Pedro forever, since she couldn't go on hurting Rosaura. That was all. But she couldn't say that to Chincha. 
She was such a gossip that if Tita told her, the next day the whole village would know. She preferred to give her no answer and change the subject without more ado, much as Chincha did to her when she was caught out on some weak point. How awful! The dough is already rising over the pan. Let me finish the bread or tomorrow night will catch us and we still won't be done. The dough wasn't yet over the top of the pan where she'd put it to rest but it was an ideal pretext to divert Chincha's attention onto another topic. When the dough has doubled in size for the second time, remove it from the container, place it on the table, and form it into a strip. If you wish, you may place some bits of candied fruit in the middle. If not, just the porcelain doll placed at random. Roll the strip, joining one edge to the other. Place the bread seam down on a greased and floured baking sheet. Form a ring with the dough, leaving enough space between the ring and the edge of the baking sheet, since the dough still has to double in size one more time. Meanwhile, light the oven to maintain a comfortable temperature in the kitchen until the bread finishes rising. Before placing the porcelain doll in the bread, Dita looked at it for a long time. Traditionally, on the night of the 6th of January, the bread is sliced and the person who finds the doll hidden inside it is required to hold the celebration on the 2nd of February, Candlemas Day, when the baby Jesus is removed from the nativity scene. Ever since they were very young, this tradition had been converted into a sort of competition between her and her sisters. The one lucky enough to find the doll was considered lucky indeed. That night, with the doll clasped tightly in her two hands, she could make any wish she wanted. Carefully studying the delicate form of the doll, she was thinking how easy it was to wish for things as a child. Then nothing seemed impossible. Growing up, one realizes how many things one cannot wish for, the things that are forbidden, sinful, indecent. But what is decent, to deny everything that you really want? She wished she had never grown up, never known Pedro, never had to flee from him. She wished her mother would stop tormenting her, jumping out at her from every corner and crying contempt for her behavior. She wished Esperanza could marry without Rosaura being able to stop her so she would never know this pain and suffering. She wished that the child would have the strength Gertrudis had shown and run away from home if necessary. She wished Gertrudis would come home to lend Tita the support she needed so much now. Making these wishes, she placed the doll on the bread and left the bread on the table so it could rise. When the bread has doubled in size a third time, decorate it with candied fruit, glaze it with a beaten egg, and sprinkle it with sugar. Bake it in the oven for 20 minutes and let it cool. When the bread was ready to serve, Tita asked Pedro to help her carry it onto the table. She could have asked anyone's help with it, but she needed to speak to him in private. Pedro, I need to talk to you alone. That's easy. Why not go to the dark room? There we can do it without anyone bothering us. I've been waiting for you to come there for several days. Those visits to the dark room are just what I have to talk to you about. Chencha interrupted their conversation to inform them that the Loboses had just arrived to the party and everyone was waiting for them to cut the bread. So Tita and Pedro had no choice but to postpone their conversation and carry the bread to the dining room, where it was anxiously awaited. As they crossed the hallway, Tita saw her mother, motionless, beside the door to the dining room, throwing her a furious look. She was petrified. Bulke began to bark at Mama Elena, who was walking toward Tita threateningly. The fur on the dog's back was sticking straight up from fear, and he was backing away, on the defensive. In his excitement, he put his back leg into the brass spittoon that stood at the end of the hall next to the fern, and when he tried to run away, he knocked it over, spraying its contents in every direction. The uproar he created drew the attention of the twelve guests, who were all sitting together in the living room. Alarmed, they looked out into the hall, and Pedro was forced to explain that Pulque did this type of inexplicable thing lately, perhaps because he was getting old, but that everything was under control. Nevertheless, Paquita Lobo could see that Tita was on the verge of fainting. She asked someone else to help Pedro carry the bread to the dining room, since she saw that Tita was not feeling well. She took her arm and led her to the living room. 
She made Tita sniff some smelling salts, and soon she had recovered completely. They then decided to go to the dining room. Before leaving, Paquita detained Tita briefly and asked, Are you feeling all right? I noticed you still seem a little dizzy, and the look on your face. If I didn't know perfectly well that you are a decent girl, I would swear that you are pregnant. Tita, laughing and trying to appear casual, replied to her, Pregnant? Only you would think of something like that. And what does the look on my face have to do with it? I can tell from a woman's eyes the minute she becomes pregnant. Tita was grateful to Pulque, who again rescued her from an awkward situation, since the incredible commotion that broke out on the patio kept her from having to continue this conversation with Paquita. Besides Pulque's barking, she could hear the sound of several horses galloping. All the guests were already in the house. Who could it be at this hour? Tita hurried to the door, opened it, and saw what Pulque was making such a fuss over. A person riding at the head of a band of revolutionary soldiers. When they got close enough, she could see that this person in charge of that troop was none other than her sister, Gertrudis. At her side rode the man who had carried her off years ago, Juan Alejandres, now a general. Gertrudis got down from her horse, and as if no time at all had passed, said confidently that since she knew it was the day they cut the three kings' bread, she had come home for a good cup of freshly whipped hot chocolate. Tita, deeply moved, embraced her and led her straight to the table to grant her her wish. In this house, they made hot chocolate like nobody else's, since they took so much care with every step in making it, from its preparation to the whipping of the chocolate, yet another critical procedure. Inexpert beating can turn an excellent quality chocolate into a disgusting drink, either by under or over cooking, making it too thick or even burnt. There's a very simple method for avoiding the aforementioned problems. Heat a square of chocolate in water. The amount of water used should be a little more than enough to fill the cups. When the water comes to a boil for the first time, remove it from the heat and dissolve the chocolate completely. Beat with a chocolate mill until it is smoothly blended with the water. Return the pan to the stove. When it comes to a boil again and starts to boil over, remove it from the heat. Put it back on the heat and bring it to a boil the third time. Remove from the heat and beat the chocolate. Pour half into a little pitcher and beat the rest of it some more. Then serve it all, leaving the top covered with foam. Hot chocolate can also be made using milk instead of water, but in this case, it should only be brought to a boil once, and the second time it's heated, it should be beaten so it doesn't get too thick. However, hot chocolate made with water is more digestible than that made with milk. Gertrudis closed her eyes each time she took a sip from the cup of chocolate she had in front of her. Life would be much nicer if one could carry the smells and tastes of the maternal home wherever one pleased. Well, this was no longer her mother's house. Her mother had died without her knowing it. She felt real grief when Tita informed her of her mother's death. She had come back with the intention of showing Mama Elena how she had triumphed in life. She was a general in the Revolutionary Army. The commission had been earned by sheer hard work. She fought like mad on the field of battle. Leadership was in her blood, and once she joined the army, she began a rapid ascent through powerful positions until she arrived at the top. Moreover, she was coming back happily married to Juan. They had met after not seeing each other for more than a year, and their passion had been reborn, just like the day they met. What more could a person ask? How she would have liked her mother to have seen it? How she would have liked to see her? even if to be told with a look that she needed to wipe the traces of chocolate from her lips with her napkin. That was chocolate prepared like it used to be. Eyes closed, Gertrudis offered up a silent prayer, asking that Tita be granted many more years in which to prepare the family recipes. Neither she nor Rosaura knew how to make them. When Tita died, her family's past would die with her. When they had finished supper, they moved to the living room and the dance began. The salon was ablaze with the light from a colossal number of candles. Juan impressed all the guests with the wonderful way he played the guitar, the harmonica, and the accordion. Gertrudis kept time to the songs Juan played, tapping the floor with the toe of her boot. 
She was watching him proudly from the far end of the salon, where a court of admirers had surrounded her, besieging her with questions about her part in the revolution. Smoking a cigarette, get through these perfectly at her ease, was regaling them with the fantastic stories of the battles she'd been in. She had them open mouth as she told them about the first firing squad she had ordered, but she couldn't contain herself. She interrupted her story and flung herself into the center of the salon, where she began to dance gracefully to the polka Jesusita in Chihuahua, which Juan was playing brilliantly on the Norteño Acordeón. She lightly hitched her skirt up to her knee, quite uninhibited. This attitude provoked scandalized comments among the ladies gathered there. Rosaura whispered in Tita's ear, I don't know where Gertrudis gets her sense of rhythm. Mama didn't like to dance, and they say Papa was very bad at it. Tita shrugged her shoulders in answer, although she knew perfectly well who had given Gertrudis her rhythm and other qualities. That secret she planned to take to her grave, but it was not to be. A year later, Gertrudis gave birth to a mulatto baby. Juan was furious and threatened to leave her. He couldn't forgive Gertrudis for having returned to her old ways. Then, Tita, to save their marriage, told them everything. It was fortunate she had not dared to burn the letters, since now her mother's black past served to establish proof of Gertrudis' innocence. It was a hard blow for him to take, but at least they didn't separate. Instead, they lived together forever and were happy more often than not. Tita knew the reason for Gertrudis' sense of rhythm, just as she knew the reason for the failure of Rosara's marriage and for her own pregnancy. Now, what she wanted to know was the solution. That was what mattered. At least now she had someone in whom to confide her problems. She hoped that Gertrudis would stay on the ranch long enough to hear her story and give her some advice. Chencha, on the other hand, wished just the opposite. She was furious at Gertrudis, not exactly at her, but at the work involved in waiting on her troop. Instead of enjoying the party, at this hour of the night, she had to set up a huge table on the patio and prepare chocolate for the 50 men in the troop. Chapter 10 October Cream Fritters Preparation Take the eggs, crack them, and separate the whites. Stir the six yolks with a cup of cream. Beat until the mixture becomes light. Pour it into a pot that has been greased with lard. The mixture should be no more than an inch thick in the baking pan. Place it on the heat over a very low flame and allow to thicken. Tita was preparing these fritters at the specific request of Gertrudis. They were her favorite dessert. It had been a long time since she had had them, and she wanted to make them before leaving the ranch the next day. Gertrudis had only been home for a week, but that was much longer than she had intended. While she greased the pot where Tita would pour the beaten cream, she never stopped talking. She had so many things to tell Tita that she could talk day and night for a month without running out of conversation. Tita listened, greatly interested. More than interested, she was afraid to let her stop. Then it would be her turn. She knew that today was the only day she had left to tell Gertrudis about her problem, and even though she was dying to get it off her chest and confess to her sister, she was worried about what attitude Gertrudis might take with her. Having Gertrudis and her troops staying at the house had not made Tita feel oppressed by extra work. Instead, it had provided her with a real peace. With so many people around the house and the patios, it was impossible to talk to Pedro, much less meet him in the dark room. This was a relief to Tita, since she wasn't ready to talk with him. Before doing that, she wanted to analyze the possible solutions to the problem of her pregnancy carefully, and Pedro were on one side. On the other, at a total disadvantage, was her sister. Rosada was weak. It was important to her how society saw her, and she was still fat and smelly. Even the remedy Tita had given her had not reduced her huge problem. What would happen if Pedro abandoned her for Tita? How much would that hurt Rosada? What about Esperanza? I'm boring you with my chatter, aren't I? Of course not, get through these. Why do you say that? You've seemed distant for quite a while. Tell me, what is it? It's about Pedro, right? Yes. 
If you still love him, then why are you going to marry John? I'm not going to marry him. I can't. Tita hugged Gertrudis and cried on her shoulder without saying anything more. Gertrudis stroked her hair tenderly but was careful to watch the fritter dessert that was on the flame. It would be a pity if she couldn't eat it. When it was almost starting to burn, she detached herself from Gita and said sweetly, Just let me take this off the burner, and then you can go back to your crying, okay? Tita couldn't keep back a smile that Gertrudi seemed more worried about the future of the fritters at the moment than about Tita's. That was understandable, for Gertrudi was unaware of the serious of her sister's problem, and she had a strong craving for fritters. Drying her tears, Tita removed the pan from the heat herself, since Gertrudis burned her hand trying to do it. Once the custard is cool, it is cut into small squares, a size that won't crumble too easily. Next, the egg whites are beaten, so the squares of custard can be rolled in them and fried in oil. Finally, the fritters are served in syrup and sprinkled with ground cinnamon. While they let the custard cool so that it could weather the storm to come, Tita confided all her problems in Gertrudis. First, she showed her how swollen her belly was and how she couldn't close her dresses and skirts. She told her how in the morning when she got up, she felt sick and queasy, how her chest hurt so that nobody could touch it, and so at last she said reluctantly that perhaps, who knows, probably most likely it was because she was a little bit pregnant. Gertrudis heard this all calmly, not fazed by any of it. In the revolution, she had seen and heard worse things than this. And tell me, does Rosada know yet? No, I don't know what she would do if she learned the truth. The truth? The truth? Look, Tita, the simple truth is that the truth does not exist. It all depends on a person's point of view. For example, in your case, the truth could be that Rosada married Pedro, showing no loyalty, not caring a damn that you really loved him. That's the truth, isn't it? Yes, but in fact, she is his wife, not me. What does that matter? Did the wedding change the way you and Pedro truly feel? No. To tell the truth, no, of course not. Because this love is one of the truest loves I've ever seen. Pedro and you have both made the mistake of trying to keep the truth a secret, but it will come out in time. Look, Mama is dead, and it's God's own truth that she wouldn't listen to reason. But Rosada is different. She knows the truth perfectly well and has to understand. What's more, I think that deep down she has always understood. You have no choice but to stand up for the truth right now. You think I should talk to her? Look, while I tell you what I would do in your place, why don't you fix the syrup for my fritters? Let's get a move on. The truth is it's getting late already. Tita accepted her advice and began to prepare the syrup without missing a single one of her sister's words. Gertrudis was sitting facing the kitchen door that led to the back patio. Tita was on the other side of the table with her back to the door, so it was impossible for her to see Pedro walking toward the kitchen carrying a bag of beans to feed the troop. Then Gertrudis, with the practiced eye she'd gained on the battlefield, made a strategic estimate of the time it would take Pedro to step over the threshold of the door, so that at the precise moment she could fire these words. I think you should tell Pedro you're expecting his child. A perfect hit. Bullseye. Pedro struck down, let the sack fall to the floor. He was dying of love for Tita. Startled, she turned to discover that Pedro was looking at her, almost in tears. A oh, Pedro, what a coincidence. My sister has something to tell you. Why don't you go out to the garden to talk while I finish the syrup? Tita didn't know whether to chide or thank Gertrudis for her interference. She would talk to her later. Right now, she had no choice but to talk to Pedro. In silence, she handed Gertrudis the dish she had been holding, in which she had started to prepare the syrup, pulled a creased sheet of paper with the recipe written on it from a box on the table, and left it with Gertrudis in case she needed it. She walked out of the kitchen, Pedro following behind her. Gertrudis needed the recipe. Without it, she'd be lost. Carefully, she began to read it and tried to follow it. Beat an egg white in half a pint of water for each two pounds of sugar, or piloncillo. Two egg whites in a pint of water for five pounds of sugar, 
or in the same proportion for greater or lesser quantities. Boil the syrup until it bubbles up three times, slowing the boil with a little cold water, which is thrown in each time it starts to rise up. Then take it off the heat, let it stand, and skim off the foam. Next, add another little bit of water as well as a chunk of orange peel, anise, or clove to taste and bring to a boil. Skim it again, and when it has reached the stage of cooking called the ball stage, strain it through a sieve or a piece of linen stretched over a frame. Get through these read this recipe as if she were reading hieroglyphics. She didn't know how much sugar was meant by five pounds or what a pint of water was, much less what this ball business was. She was the one who was all balled up. She went out on the patio to ask Chincha for help. Chincha had just finished serving beans to the congregation at the fifth breakfast mess. This was the last mess she had to serve, but as soon as she was done feeding them, she had to get ready for the next ones, since the revolutionaries who had received their sacred sustenance at the first breakfast mess were coming back to eat, and so on and so on until ten at night, when she was done serving the last supper. For that reason, it was perfectly understandable that she would be awfully angry and irritable at anyone who approached her to ask her to do any extra work. Generala, though she was, Gertrudis was no exception. Chencha flatly refused to give her any assistance. She wasn't part of Gertrudis' troop. She didn't have to obey blindly like the men under her command. Then Gertrudis was tempted to appeal to her sister, but her common sense stopped her. She could not disturb Tita and Pedro in any way at this time, perhaps the most critical moment of their lives. Tita was slowly walking between the fruit trees in the garden, its smell of orange blossoms mingling with the jasmine scent always given off by her body. Pedro, at her side, was holding her arm tenderly. Why didn't you tell me? I wanted to decide what to do first. And have you decided? No. I think it would be good for you to know before you make a decision that for me, having a child with you is the best stroke of luck and to enjoy it the way we should. I would like to go far away from here with you. We can't think only of ourselves. There are also Rosaura and Esperanza to consider. What's going to happen to them? Pedro couldn't answer. He hadn't thought of them until now, and to be honest, he didn't want to hurt them nor stop seeing his little girl. He had to have a solution fair to all of them. He would have to find one. At least there was one thing certain. Tita would not leave the ranch with John Brown. A noise behind them made them jump. Someone was coming up behind them. Pedro dropped Tita's arm and turned his head furtively to see who it was. It was Pulque, who had gotten tired of listening to get through these shouting in the kitchen and was looking for a better place to get some sleep. Anyway, they decided to postpone their conversation until another time. There were too many people all around the house. It was too risky to talk about such private matters. In the kitchen, Gertrudis wasn't having much success getting Sergeant Trevino to fix the syrup the way she wanted, no matter how many orders she gave him. She was sorry she had ever entrusted Trevino with such an important mission. When she had asked a group of rebels, who knew how much a pound was, and he had fired back the answer that a pound was 460 grams and a pint was a quarter of a liter, she thought he knew a lot about cooking, but he didn't. In fact, this was the first time Trevino had ever failed in something with which she had entrusted him. She remembered one occasion when he had to uncover a spy who had infiltrated the troop. A prostitute who was the spy's mistress had learned of his activities, and before she could denounce him, he had gunned her down cold-bloodedly. Gertrudis was returning from taking a bath in the river and found her in the throes of death. The prostitute managed to gasp out a clue to identifying him. The traitor had a red mole shaped like a spider between his legs. Gertrudis couldn't ask to inspect all the men in the troop since not only could that be taken the wrong way, but the traitor could get suspicious and flee before they got to him. So she entrusted the mission to Trevino. Even for him, it was no easy task. What they'd think about him was worse than what they'd think about her if he went prying into the crotches of all the men in the troop. 
So the patient Trevino waited until they got to Saltillo. The minute they got to town, he took on the job of going to every single brothel and gaining the confidence of every single prostitute, using who knew what kind of arts. But the main thing was that Trevino always treated them like ladies. He made them feel like queens. He was gallant and cultivated. He recited verses and poems while making love to them. Not one had escaped his clutches, and they were all ready to work for the revolution. In that way, with the help of his friends, the whores, it didn't take him more than three days to uncover the traitor and set a trap for him. The traitor went into a room in the whorehouse with a peroxide blonde named Husky Voice. Trevino was waiting behind the door. Trevino kicked the door shut, and then, in an unprecedented display of violence, he killed the traitor by beating him to death. When there was no more life left in him, Trevino cut off his testicles with a knife. When Getrudis asked him why he had murdered him so brutally and not simply dispatched him with a bullet, he replied that it had been an act of revenge. Years ago, a man who had a red mole in the shape of a spider between his legs had raped his mother and his sister. The latter had confessed before dying. So, by doing this, Trevino had restored the honor of his family. It was the only savage act Trevino committed in his life, except for that, he was refined and elegant, even in killing. He always did it with perfect dignity. After the capture of the spy, Trevino kept his reputation as a great womanizer, which was not far from the truth, yet Getrudis was ever the love of his life. He tried for months to conquer her without success, but never losing hope until Gertrudis found Juan again. Then he realized that he had lost her forever. Now he was only her watchdog, protecting her flanks, not letting her out of his sight for a second. On the battlefield, he was one of her finest soldiers, but in the kitchen, he wasn't very good for much. Still, it would grieve Gertrudis to throw him out since Trevino was very emotional and when she reprimanded him for anything, he always took to drink. So she had no choice. She had to face up to her mistake in choosing him and try to make the best of it. Cautiously, the two of them read over the infernal recipe step by step, trying to make sense of it. If the syrup is to be clarified, as it must be to sweeten liquors, after the previous procedures have been completed, tilt the pot or saucepan containing the syrup. Let stand and decant, or in other words, pour off as carefully as possible to separate the syrup from the sediment. The recipe did not explain what the ball stage was, so Gertrudis ordered the sergeant to search for an answer in a huge cookbook that was in the storeroom. Trevino was making a real effort to find the information they needed, but in fact he barely knew how to read. His fingers slowly followed the words as an impatient Gertrudis looked on. Candy syrup has many degrees of cooking, soft thread stage, firm thread stage, soft pearl stage, firm pearl stage, blowing stage, pouring stage, solidifying stage, and caramelizing stage, softball stage. Finally, here's softball stage, General. Let's see, bring it here. You've been driving me crazy. Get through these read the instructions to her sergeant quickly in a loud voice. To test if the syrup is at the soft ball stage, moisten your fingers in a glass or jug of cold water and pick up some syrup, immediately dipping them back into the water. If the syrup forms a small ball when it cools but handles like a paste, it is cooked to the soft ball stage. Understand? Yes, at least I think so, my general. You'd better, because if you don't, I swear, I'll have you shot. At last, Gertrudis had managed to gather all the information she'd been seeking. Only one thing was left now, and that was for the sergeant to do a good job making the syrup. Then she could finally eat the fritters she craved so much. Trevino was very much aware of the threat hanging over his head if he made a mistake while cooking for his superior. He completed his mission despite his inexperience. They were both ecstatic. Trevino was the happiest. He brought Tita a fritter himself, carried it up to her room on orders from Getrudis to get Tita's stamp of approval. 
Tita hadn't come down for lunch and had spent the afternoon in bed. Trevino entered her bedroom and set the fritter down on a little table Tita used just for such occasions when she ate there rather than in the dining room. She was grateful for his attentiveness and congratulated him since the fritter was really delicious. Trevino said he was sorry Tita was indisposed. He would have been delighted to ask her to dance at the party being held on the patio to say goodbye to General Gertrudis. Tita assured him that she would be delighted to dance with him if she decided to come down to the party. Trevino withdrew quickly to go brag to the troops about what Tita had said. As soon as the sergeant was gone, Tita lay down on her bed again. She had no desire to be anywhere else. Her belly was too swollen, and she couldn't sit for very long. Tita thought of the many times she had germinated kernels or seeds of rice, beans, or alfalfa without giving any thought to how it felt for them to grow and change form so radically. Now she admired the way they opened their skin and allowed the water to penetrate them fully until they were split asunder to make way for new life. She imagined the pride they felt as the tip of the first root emerged from inside of them, the humility with which they accepted the loss of their previous form, the bravery with which they showed the world their new leaves, Tita would love to be a simple seed, not to have to explain to anyone what was growing inside her to show her fertile belly to the world without laying herself open to society's disapproval. Seeds didn't have that kind of problem. They didn't have a mother to be afraid of or a fear of those who would judge them. Tita no longer had a mother, but she couldn't get rid of that feeling that any minute some awful punishment was going to descend on her from the great beyond courtesy of Mama Elena. That was a familiar feeling. It was like the fear she felt when she was cooking and didn't follow a recipe to the letter. She was always sure when she did it that Mama Elena would find out and instead of congratulating her on her creativity, give her a terrible tongue lashing for disobeying the rules. But she couldn't resist the temptation to violate the oh-so-rigid rules her mother imposed in the kitchen and in life. She stayed there resting for quite a while, lying on the bed. She only got up when she heard Pedro singing a love song beneath the window. Tita sprang to the window and threw it open. How could Pedro dare to be so brazen? As soon as she saw him, she knew the answer. She could tell at a glance he was roaring drunk. Juan, standing next to him, was accompanying him on the guitar. Tita was in a panic. She hoped that Rosada was already asleep. If she wasn't, there was going to be trouble. A furious Mama Elena came into her room and said to her, See what you've done now? You and Pedro are shameless. If you don't want blood to flow in this house, go where you can't do any harm to anybody before it's too late. The one who should be going is you. I'm tired of your tormenting me. Leave me in peace once and for all. Not unless you behave like a good woman, or a decent one at least. What do you mean, decent? Like you? Yes, but that's just what I'm doing. Or didn't you have an illicit child? You will be condemned to hell for talking to me like this. No more than you. Shut your mouth. Who do you think you are? I know who I am, a person who has a perfect right to live her life as she pleases. Once and for all, leave me alone. I won't put up with you. I hate you. I've always hated you. Tita had said the magic words that would make Mama Elena disappear forever. The imposing figure of her mother began to shrink until it became no more than a tiny light. As the ghost faded away, a sense of relief grew inside Tita's body. The inflammation in her belly and the pain in her breast began to subside. The muscles at the center of her body relaxed, loosening a violent menstrual flow. This discharge, so many days late, relieved all her pains. She gave a deep, peaceful sigh. She wasn't pregnant. But her problems weren't over. The little light, all that was left of Mama Elena's image, began to spin feverishly. It went through the window and shot out onto the patio like a firecracker out of control. Pedro, drunk as he was, didn't realize the danger. Cheerfully crooning Estrellita by Manuel M. Ponce, he stood under Tita's window, surrounded by some rebels who were as drunk as he was. 
Gertrudis and Juan didn't see the danger approaching either. They were dancing like a pair of love-struck teenagers by the glow of one of the many oil lamps set up on the patio to light up the party. The firecracker moved fast, approaching Pedro, whirling crazily with enough violence to make the lamp closest to him explode into a thousand pieces. The oil quickly spread the flames onto Pedro's face and body. Tita, who was taking measures to cope with her menstruation, heard the pandemonium set off by Pedro's accident. She rushed to the window, opened it, and saw Pedro running across the patio like a human torch. Then Gertrudis caught up with him, tearing the skirt from her dress, wrapping it around him and knocking him to the ground. Tita didn't know how she got down the stairs, but in less than 20 seconds, she was at Pedro's side. As she arrived, Gertrudis was removing his smoldering clothes. Pedro was howling in pain. He had burns over his whole body. Several men carefully lifted him between them to carry him to his bedroom. Tita, holding Pedro's unburnt hand, refused to leave his side. As they went up the stairs, Rosada opened her bedroom door. She noticed the smell of burnt feathers immediately. She went to the stairs, intending to go down and see what was happening, and there she found the group carrying Pedro, with him at the center in a cloud of smoke. Tita, at his side, was weeping uncontrollably. Rosada's first impulse was to run and help her husband. Tita tried to let go of Pedro's hand so that Rosada could get closer to him, but Pedro, between moans, cried out to her, addressing his familiarity for the first time. Tita, don't go. Please don't leave me. No, Pedro, I won't. Tita took Pedro's hand. For a moment, Rosada and Tita looked at each other challengingly. Then Rosada understood that there was nothing for her to do here, and she went back to her room and locked the door behind her. She didn't come back out for a week. Since Tita didn't want to leave Pedro's side, she commanded Chincha to bring her lots of egg whites beaten with oil and finely grated raw potatoes. Those were the best ways she knew to deal with burns. The egg whites are applied very gently to the injured area and reapplied each time the preparation dries. After this, plasters made of grated raw potatoes should be applied to reduce the inflammation and relieve the pain. Tita spent the whole night dispensing these home remedies. While she applied the potato plaster, she studied Pedro's beloved face. There was no sign of his bushy eyebrows and his long eyelashes. His square chin was now an oval from the swelling. It didn't matter to Tita if he was left with scars, but it might to Pedro. How could she prevent scarring? Nacha gave her the answer, just as morning light had previously given it to her. In a case like this, the best remedy was the bark of the Teposcoite tree, which must be placed on Pedro. Tita went running out onto the patio, even though it was very late at night. She got Nicholas up and told him to get this bark from the best brujo in the region. It was almost daybreak before she managed to soothe Pedro's pain a little, so that he was able to fall asleep for a moment. She took advantage of this opportunity to go out to say goodbye to Gertrudis, since she had been hearing movements and voices outside for quite a while as the men in her troop saddled up their horses to get ready to go. Gertrudis spoke with Tita for a long time, saying she was sorry she could not stay and help Tita in this misfortune, but her orders were to attack Zacatecas. Gertrudis thanked her sister for the happy moments she had spent with her, advised her to not give up the battle for Pedro, and before departing gave her a recipe the prostitutes use so that they don't get pregnant. After having intimate relations, Use a douche bag of boiled water with a few drops of vinegar. Juan came up and interrupted this conversation to tell Gertrudis it was time to leave. Juan gave Tita a powerful embrace and told her to convey to Pedro his best wishes for his recovery. Tita and Gertrudis embraced each other, full of emotion. Gertrudis got onto her horse and rode away. She wasn't riding alone. She carried a childhood beside her in the cream fritters she had enclosed in a jar in her saddlebag. Tita watched them go with tears in her eyes. Chincha did too, but unlike Tita's, her words were tears of joy. At last, she'd get to rest. When Tita was going back into the house, she heard Chincha scream, No, it can't be. They're coming back already. In fact, it did look like someone from the troops was returning to the ranch, but it was hard to see who because of the dust the horses had raised as they left. 
Straining her eyes, Dita was thrilled to see John's cart. He was back already. When she saw it, Dita felt completely confused. She didn't know what she was going to do or what she was going to tell him. Part of her felt an enormous joy at seeing him, but another part felt terrible at having to call off their engagement. John approached her with a huge bouquet of flowers. He embraced her warmly, but when he kissed her, he knew that something had changed inside of Dita.